Maybe we should go ahead. Yeah. People will trickle in. Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, my name is Daniel Feliciano. I'm going to be the moderator for this session, uh, Mechanistic Tissue Biology 2. Uh, and today, our first speaker will be Amy Shire from Rockefeller University. And uh, Amy is going to tell us a little bit about supracellular regulation of symmetry breaking in the skin. Amy. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been really inspiring to be here, and so much so that I um, decided to change my title and incorporate a little more whimsy into it because it feels like this is a safe space to do so. Um, and what I'm alluding to here is really just that in the lab, our view is that these fundamental concepts from complexity science are central to our understanding of morphogenesis. Um, and it's been particularly important to develop a competency for process. And so when I look at videos like this, um, I'm really inspired to think about how we can capture um, sort of the emergent dynamics in the processes that we're studying. And so that's something we've been working to do to um, observe dynamics across a whole system. And this has really been a bottleneck um, in studies of how structures emerge in our uh, vertebrate organs um, and perhaps why we're still really just scratching the surface here. Um, and I think another challenge in our approach to understanding how these patterns form in our organs is that there are, of course, events happening across scales simultaneously. And so how do we anchor conceptually and experimentally here? And I think it's fair to say that over the last several decades, um, our bias has been to anchor at the molecular scale. And this is because there are these really um, kind of comforting models like that of a molecular blueprint where you lay down a pattern of gene expression in the embryo and then this leads to local changes in cell behavior and then ultimately tissue morphogenesis. And so I guess I'd say these are tempting because they really justify a focus at just one scale. Um, and so it's sort of compelled the collective energy of the field to um, come together and generate an understanding of molecular interactions um, as well as to map out gene regulatory networks. But in my studies of um, morphogenesis in our organs, these types of molecular blueprint models haven't been able to explain the patterns in question. And so this has compelled a consideration of self-organization um, at other length scales. And the one that my lab is most invested in right now is the multicellular scale. Um, and so we're really interested in how cells in collectives generate the patterns of our organs. And as these patterns are initiated, um, you can really categorize these collectives as sort of consisting of mesenchymal tissues um, or epithelial ones. And um, fortunately, in the last maybe decade or so, there has been an increase in our understanding of the self-organization that's going on on the epithelial side of things, um, but we're uh, a bit behind when it comes to the mesenchyme. And so um, just a sort of very brief mesenchyme 101, it's one of these sort of basic tissue types um, in our developing and adult body. Um, it's the precursor to the connective tissues in our body. And importantly, um, it's composed of cells that are surrounded by and interacting with extracellular matrix. And so as we set out to grapple with this multicellular scale and consider the types of self-organization that could be going on in this kind of wild west of the mesenchyme, um, it's been important to import as much simplicity in the system as possible. And so we're strategic about how we select our model organs. And um, in the lab, we're working with a few different organ systems, um, but the work I'll talk about today um, pertains to the skin, which brings with it a really welcome simplicity um, in its form, in that it's just a sheet, um, and also in the pattern, which is um, really a simple grid of follicles. And so um, this grid is especially regular in our model system of choice, which is the chicken embryo. Um, and this pattern emerges at about a week into development. And if we dive in to look at what's happening at this multicellular scale, um, we see that the process involves two tissue layers. So there's a superficial epithelium called the epidermis, and this is a top um, a layer of mesenchymally derived tissue that's called the dermis. And so these both start out uniform um, and then come together to kind of co-aggregate into this structure that um, is the primordia for the follicle and ultimately the feather. And so in previous work, I'm not going to talk about today, what we found is that um, mechanical events in the mesenchyme, in this dermal layer, are responsible for generating this pattern of follicles. 
However, um, it wasn't clear what sort of mechanism in a tissue like the mesenchyme might be responsible for giving us this kind of tissue level order. And so this was a, a major goal of the lab to try to understand when we started at Rockefeller um, now four years ago. And so um, fortunately for us, uh, as we uh, consider this process in the chicken embryo and the developing skin, um, this system brings with it another layer of simplicity in that this 2D grid of follicles forms progressively in birds um, from an initial row that then templates lateral rows to fill the field. And so what this offers us is the opportunity, clicking issues, um, to center our studies really uh, around this one dimensional event where we can uh, try to understand how a uniform band of cells transforms into one with regularly spaced multicellular aggregates. And so um, in our uh, approach to trying to understand this transformation, uh, again, we sort of zoomed in on the scale um, that we're focused on, the multicellular, and tried to appreciate what's happening architecturally here as the system undergoes this pattern formation. And so what we find when we look here at this initial starting um, band of cells is that they are uniform and isotropically organized. The ECM is as well. But on the scale of several hours, what we find is that the, there's this, um, what is a head to tail orientation of the cells and the extracellular matrix along this pattern forming domain. And so um, as we considered this, we realized that although this isn't maybe as obvious a pre-pattern as let's say a polka dot pattern of gene expression across the skin, that nevertheless this still might be a sort of multicellular blueprint that is a necessary precondition for the pattern. And we wanted to try to understand sort of what sort of nonlinear leaps the system might be making for this to be the case. And so again, we realized we might need to simplify one more layer. And so what we set out to do was to reconstitute this process outside of the complexity of the whole embryo. Maybe I need to aim it this way. Um, and so, and really just capture this transformation um, using primary cells from the dermis, but out, outside of any other complicating factors. And so we spent quite a bit of time engineering a system to do this. Um, I'd say that the key here was really sort of getting out of the way and giving the cells the right amount of constraint, um, but also freedom to sort of do this dance that they do in the body. And so our platform involves taking out a skin um, from the chicken embryo and we remove and discard the epidermis because again, we wanna see what's autonomously possible from the dermal layer. And then we collect the dermis and dissociate the cells um, and then plate them as a single cell suspension on a very carefully engineered collagen gel. And through um, a, a, an effect of fluid dynamics called the coffee ring effect, cells land around the perimeter of this droplet, um, giving us effectively this sort of one dimensional band of cells just now wrapped around the edge of a circle. And this has sort of the, the welcome effect of eliminating any uh, messiness we might get at the edge. And, and I now understand this is a trick that let's say theorists have been using for quite some time. So we're recapitulating this initial starting condition um, in culture and then seeing what emerges. And so in this video, um, you'll see a video that takes place over 48 hours. Um, there's about 20,000 cells and it's about three millimeters wide. And so you can see the cells land and spontaneously rearrange into a pattern that very nicely recapitulates the sort of regular pattern um, of follicles. And so this platform is, there we go, ha, um, relatively high throughput. We're doing this in multi-well plates and imaging um, every, quite often over several days. And so we have this opportunity to really capture um, this process that we're interested in um, and sort of appreciate the dynamics. Um, it's also satisfying then to just observe that, that this particular cell population has this potential to self-organize into this pattern. And with this in hand, what we set out to do next was use this system to try to unpack what are sort of the rules as we've been saying here um, that allow this pattern to form. And one critical component we landed on is the extracellular matrix. Here you're looking at fibronectin that's fluorescently labeled. So it's, it's generated and deposited by the cells and then rearranged alongside them. These are beads embedded in the collagen gel and you can see it's very heavily remodeled by the cells as they rearrange. Um, also important to observe was that just like what we see is happening in the body, the cells here land, elongate, and orient around the axis um, where the pattern forms. And the sort of coherence of this organization is, is visible here in these static images where you can see 
um, that across the entire collective, the cells generate this um, kind of aligned conformation. And it's true for both the cells uh, and the extracellular matrix. So they're adopting this almost nomadic-like or ordering along this continuum throughout the tissue. And so given the fact that this alignment persists ex vivo, um, what that tells us is one, that it's self-organized. So it's not something that comes about due to, let's say, other tissue layers in the body or something like the growth of the body. Um, and it also, I think, compels us to, to continue to consider that this is some sort of important precondition for the pattern. And so we set out to understand how it is that cells generate this order. And we found that two of the critical rules are that the cells need to pull. So if we inhibit contractility, the system doesn't align. On the other side of things, the extracellular matrix needs to be able to respond. And so if we over cross-link the system, we find that the cells and matrix can't align as well. And so these and other experiments help to um, put together a kind of model where we consider there's a reciprocal cell ECM exchange where contractile cells in this geometry pull the ECM and begin to align it. That alignment further orients the cells, therefore it continues to align the ECM. And so there's this feedback loop um, that ultimately generates this sort of new entity at the supracellular level um, that is this oriented tissue. And of course, this happens. Um, we, see, we see the same set of events in vivo. But even with this understanding of how you might get this structure, it, it wasn't really clear how it is that this leap is made. And actually, with everything we know from extracellular matrix biology, as you deposit more extracellular matrix, um, and as it orients in this way, it would presumably be harder to segregate into these units. And so this sort of leap became kind of a puzzle for us, um, and one we were only able to solve once we started to import ideas from fluid dynamics and soft matter physics, um, and started to conceive of this sort of supracellular structure as having fluid-like properties. And so the fluids around us undergo spontaneous transformations from a film to droplets, um, and this, these are there were well-studied transformations and phenomena. And of course, this is happening because there's sort of a relationship about the attraction of the component parts of the fluid and the surfaces they're on. And so um, we began to consider whether the supracellular structure adopts fluid-like properties that then compels this transformation into a pattern. And um, these ideas and the formalization of them were all done in collaboration with Anna Erzberger, who was a postdoc at Rockefeller and is now has her own group at EMBL in Heidelberg. And so Anna conceived of the cell ECM layer together through a continuum model as an active attractive fluid. And so set out using um, the measurements we can make in the system to determine if a predicted output of this sort of setup would be a spontaneous pattern. So I, I don't have time to go into the model much, but I'll say, in fact, she does find that particular combinations of these two key variables of contractility and hydrodynamic length, which you can think of as sort of the viscosity of the system, um, that at a particular combination of these, uh, these parameters, you do predict spontaneous pattern formation. And we can sort of play with and test this model a little more. I'll just give an example where we tuned contractility in the system. Um, and we find, Anna finds in her simulations that um, she sees a strong dependency of the wavelength of the pattern on contractility. And when we do these same um, perturbations experimentally in tuned contractility, we find we mit that the model nicely predicts the trends we see um, in pattern geometry. And so um, the, this work is part of a publication that came out this summer. So there's a bit more there to check out, and I encourage you to do so. Um, I didn't cover all the data here, but I'll go over the model as a whole. And so what we found is that an initially isotropic pools, pool of cells in ECM um, through the contraction of cells and sort of the response of the extracellular matrix goes through a feedback loop that um, progressively aligns the system. One element I didn't go into at all today is that as the cells remodel the matrix and align it, they then sense the, this sort of change in their extracellular mechanics using calcium signaling to increase their contractility. So there's an iteration of this sort of simple rule of, of pull and rearrange, pull and rearrange, in that uh, the rearrange system gets stiffer and the pulling gets harder. And so all of this leads to this sort of new whole of the system, a supracellular unit um, that ultimately generates a combination of parameters such that it undergoes an instability and forms this pattern. 
And so just to loop around sort of these ideas we started with, um, as, we can, as we consider process that are actually able to observe the emergent pattern form, maybe we become a little less dependent on the idea that there has to be a plan from the start. Um, and that uh, although molecular pre-patterns are conceptually tempting, um, we may need to, to sort of explore beyond this scale in, in our ideas of self-organization. And, and touching on this idea of scale, what's the right scale? Well, certainly all of them need to be covered, but where do we start? I think when we're studying these emergent processes, we can't ignore the scale where the action happens. Um, and we can't reduce that process to its component parts um, given their elements that happen at the level of a whole one couldn't predict. And lastly, this idea of relation. I think what I've shown here is that as important as the pieces are, the relationship between them um, is equally or maybe even more important. Um, and the whole or so, so the larger entities that are generated as a result of those relations are also sort of regulatory in development. And so if we think about the importance of sort of these relations and the whole, maybe it begs the question of to what extent can we really imagine that these are truly encoded in the genome. And so with that, I will end with my thank yous. Um, this project was led by Carl Palmquist, who's a graduate student in the lab. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Alan Rodriguez, with whom I've co-led the lab since its start. Um, and uh, I'll thank the whole group and our funding sources, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, a question came in online from Maya Evanitsky. Unlike in vivo, the self-organized patterning in vitro doesn't seem very uniform. What do you think regulates the spacing between feather primordia? Um, the patterning we see ex vivo is very regular. Um, when it's not, it's usually our fault. So we're just human beings trying to recapitulate sort of the beauty and, and robustness in the embryo, and we fail at that sometimes. Um, but when we quantify regularity to the extent one can, we see it very much approximates what you get in the whole tissue. Um, what regulates the wavelength? Um, there are a number of variables, as we showed, contractility is one, the sort of viscosity and ECM properties are another. The geometry is another variable that I didn't talk about, but there's a strong dependency of the pattern wavelength on the width of the starting stripe. Um, and we think that actually may be a way that the pattern is tuned across different species and body regions simply by tuning the geometry. And uh, one more um, follow-up question. Uh, is this symmetry broken in conditions like wounding, cancer, et cetera? Does symmetry exist in other than homeostasis? Um, does symmetry exist other than in homeostasis? I guess symmetry breaking here I would define as you have a uniform system and then some aspect of it has to make a choice and you go down different roads. So I think there is certainly symmetry breaking in contexts like tumorigenesis. It's just less beautiful and regular, um, I guess I would say. Really beautiful talk. So I, I just want to say, like, you know, uh, why do they need to align into a ring and then, you know, like break up? Uh, why couldn't they just like be a lattice and then, you know, like uh, get into like little little dots? Yeah. Did you do some coating or was it just like confined? Oh, with why they land well? in a ring? Yeah. yeah, it's a natural consequence of the fluid dynamics of a droplet kind of evaporating into a gel. Hmm. So we don't have to design it, which is important because print, sort of printing and stamping geometries is is certainly possible in in, in vitro contexts. There's another layer of challenge if you're doing that on a gel, and our gel is very special, so, um, and, and has properties that we think, we need to have properties that mimic what's happening in the embryo. So it was fortunate that we could do it this way without having to invent a technology to print on that gel. Yeah. Two more questions. So in, in vitro, the one dimensional uh, comes from the geometry that, you, that is sort of emergent. Yeah. In vivo, you have a sheet so well, you nonetheless have a single line. Do you mm -hmm. understand how that emerges then, that you have a single line? Yeah, so yeah, in birds, there are these lines, and we're studying the one in the back, but there are lines on the shoulders and the hips, um, and I don't think it's known how those form. Um, they form in interesting places that seem to co sort of align with what's happening elsewhere in the body, so you're on top of the spine and the shoulders and the hips. There could be some, I think, physical constraints that take migrating cells of the dermis and kind of bottleneck them in one little ridge. Um, but that, we use the line as our T0, but the question of how it forms is equally interesting and, and we don't know. Last question. So are, is all the ECM brought into these aggregates 
when I'd you say have that process? It, ex vivo, most of it is. Um, okay. In vivo, of course, you're not ripping holes in the tissue. Yeah. So it's less binary. Um, there are also events that get triggered by the aggregation, and this relates to our previous work where we showed the aggregation triggers beta catenin movement and turning on a whole host of genes in the follicle. So, so I'm turning wondering on those genes, I think, yeah. captures what's initiated mechanically and keeps it from going off the rails. Like in so the I'm wondering whether you've tried to model hmm. um, a process that's not just mechanical, but basically, is it possible that these cells are secreting some sort of protease mm. that is remodeling yeah. the extracellular matrix, you know, yes. making it, you know, less rigid or whatever, and that could drive some of this self-organization? Yes. Certainly these cells are using MMPs to digest the matrix. To what extent that is a consistent component of fibroblastin matrix or a regulatory aspect of this process, we haven't yet pursued. Was so it put into your model at all? The MMPs are not. The, the, the overall, the, the variable sort of the viscosity of the, yeah. of the ECM uh, or of the cell ECM layer just, accounts for what might yeah. involve that. But, um, you know, we found that contractility shifts. We don't know whether secretion of MMP also shifts. And yeah. that's something that, you know, we're looking into as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. All right. Our next speaker is uh, Jitu Meyer from Na National Center of Biological Science. Uh, Jitu is going to tell us something about building a morphogen gradient, tier by tier, in the wind imaginal disk of Drosophila. Right. Um, yeah, um, this, this is uh, an area that I don't normally uh, work on, but I think given 4DCP, it's an inspiration uh, to consider how cells can begin to build build um, bigger structures. I mean, the, the, the two lectures before me have been so amazing that I probably don't need to have any introduction about that. But let me just tell you what, what we do in the lab. We've, uh, we're looking at cell in cells and their interfaces, effectively this four nanometer sheet of membrane, uh, trying to understand its composition, its organization, and its physical, both chemistry and physics. Um, but there are both cell extrinsic and cell intrinsic uh, factors that influence this, the chemistry of the system, um, and uh, active energy-consuming mechanisms that make up this active biomaterial, which is surrounding every cell uh, on this planet, including uh, bacteria. Um, but what we would like to ask is, what are the functional consequences of such cell and tissue uh, organization, and of course tissue organization, which underlie the generation of uh, physiology? I've uh, been working, you know, on very small scales on membrane receptors, cell adhesion molecules, uh, understanding how cells undergo mechano sensing, and now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about tissue scale patterning. Uh, uh, the work uh, is about building a tiered wingless morphogen gradient and un and its consequences for uh, robust building a robust gradient. The work is actually, you know, really almost entirely that of uh, Chetra. Uh, Prabhakara, who is a um, finishing graduate student in the lab, uh, in collaboration with Tim Saunders for some work and with um, my close friend and collaborator, physicist Madan Rao, and his uh, student, Krishnan. So um, let me start. Uh, I don't have these fancy images of amazing biological patterns, but uh, they may arise. And 50 years ago, uh, Lewis Walpert uh, suggested that they might arise from local secretion. Uh, followed by interrogation of the gradient that forms from this local secreted uh, morphogen. So uh, if a morphogen is secreted here and forms a gradient, uh, the distance from the production domain uh, may be instructive to the underlying tissue that senses this mor morphogen. Now, um, so there's an input, there's a processing, which is, of course, at the scale of the cell, and there's an output which results in a pattern. Now, um, and I mean, there's amazing work that goes on in this area, and I think Harnan is going to tell us something a little bit later, too, about models. Uh, and very quickly, very early on, uh, I think also quite cheekily, uh, Crick said that, you know, the secreted morphogen can diffuse, and the time scales are right, therefore diffusion is a mechanism by which you can generate the gradient as long as you have a sink. And, um, and then uh, the question really emerges, how do you, how do you build uh, a spatial pattern of cell fates in a developing tissue precisely 
when diffusion and processes that are subject to a lot of noise uh, uh, need, need to be kept in check. And I, I'd like to argue that it is in fact the cells themselves, and you know, this is part of uh, understanding how cellular mechanisms can, can involve in interrogating signals, uh, that cells themselves, when they are subject to such uh, extrinsic or intrinsic noise, uh, can act as local cell autonomous morphogenetic decoders. And I think this is something that um, maybe Ruslan was also adhering to yes, uh, alluding to yesterday about what are the rules by which these sorts of things can occur and what are the mechanisms involved. So I'm going to try and talk to you about that. Well, first of all, what's a gradient? A gradient uh, uh, in, of a morphogen is uh, something that's produced locally and travels a distance. And you know, the point about having a morphogen gradient is that one should be able to measure it in space and in time. And, um, and when something is secreted, uh, you know, there are going to be multiple levels uh, of a morphogen, one in the secreted uh, lumen of a, of a tissue, um, at the surface of the cell, and, and inside the cell. And so, but when we measure a morphogen gradient, we usually measure everything at the same time and, and categorize it as the gradient. Um, so the question we have asked in a very specific context is can we measure the concentration profiles of secreted morphogen in, in the different pools that I just alluded to? Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, do cells have a cell autonomous processing system for mini minimizing this uh, positional inference error that's going to arise due to this uh, process of production and, uh, and movement? I think uh, uh, that's uh, basically, so we've used a system that of the Drosophila, um, a, a wing imaginal disc, uh, dissected from a, la a hapless larvae, uh, which of course develops into a beautiful uh, fly uh, and, uh, and a fantastic wing. Uh, but the, the wing imaginal disc that we dissect is shown as a structure here. And it has actually extremely convoluted geometry as well, which will come into uh, play a little bit. Um, and um, the, 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 the gradient that we're looking at is that of those uh, generated by a secreted uh, uh, molecule called wingless uh, at the uh, DV boundary of the, of the Drosophila wing pouch. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and you know, um, Ch Ch Chaitra um, uh, spent uh, some time with Suzanne Eaton, uh, who sadly passed away a few years ago, but she was very inspired by the work that she did and went and learned how to actually take these wing discs out of the fly and make some really uh, excellent ex vivo cultures of the wing disc and one could preserve structure and morphology and, and look at what happens. Um, and here is a uh, wingless morphogen that, uh, no, uh, sorry, here is a, a, a marker of a membrane that shows us, in fact, how, how complex and convoluted this structure is. It forms a little bubble uh, at the, at the cell uh, uh, on the surface. And if you actually squash the whole thing, the entire process gets disrupted. Now, um, so what, what we had to do to make measurements of anything in the system is, act, is actually transform the system from, a, from an imaging axis in a confocal system which, where you collect planes to that of the sample axis where you can build surfaces. Uh, and in fact, that's uh, Chetra spent some time with uh, Tim Saunders again to uh, do exactly that and was able to make actually some really nice, uh, um, uh, uh, develop some really nice methods where you could normalize the, the, the gradients that one sees due to all the artifacts in the system by, uh, uh, by uh, sort of taking something that should be uniformly expressed and create a normalization matrix for this system after you in fact uh, make this transformation. And using that, she was able to uh, uh, create sort of corrected um, uh, images of and data. Now what's happened here? Oops. <coughs> ah, something happened. OK. Uh, uh, just have corrections in terms of the uh, the, 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 the epithelia and, and the uh, fluorescence intensity signatures we get. Now, if you look at a wingless, the wingless gradient itself, um, sorry, here's sort, of a, 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 you know, here's sort of proof that the correction actually works. Here's a uniform uh, uh, expressing uh, molecule uh, at the surface of this epithelium. Uh, 
uh, it exhibits sort of a, a, an artifact, that of a gradient, but if you now correct it using the procedures that uh, uh, Chaitra has developed, uh, you get this uh, you know, really corrected um, uh, uh, intensity profile, which shows a uniform uh, you know, uh, pattern of, fl of fluorescence intensity. Um, the wing, uh, so now if you take, uh, well, in a fly, you can do all sorts of interesting genetics, and you can replace the wing, wingless molecule with a tagged wingless protein. The fly is, emerges completely normal, uh, and uh, imaging the, the wingless in the, in the system itself, <clears throat> one ends up with uh, a gradient uh, after correction that is extremely steep, uh, and that's simply because what we are imaging the entire total uh, signal coming from this wingless, which also includes that of the production domain. And in fact, that's typically the kind of signal that would have been measured for me measuring any, any sort of uh, 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 a gradient in, in these uh, epithelial systems where secretion is followed by movement of the molecule. Um, <clears throat> so, but then uh, what we need, wanted to do using this uh, uh, system is now make measurements of what happens, for example, to the luminal uh, pool of the molecule. Uh, for that, we used uh, um, you know, site-specific uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy in this wing disk and monitored the concentration of the, of the, uh, of the fluorophore that was secreted, the wingless fluorophore that was secreted. And what we found uh, was that uh, it exhibited a sort of a, a uniform uh, uh, signature of uh, fluorescence uh, of diffusion across the entire disk. Uh, and the, using that, uh, uh, you, you, using FCS, you can also calculate the number of molecules in that confocal volume that is used for measurement. Uh, we could determine the, the fall off of the concentration of the, uh, of the fluorophore in the uh, lumen of the disk. And again, what we ended up is an extremely uh, steep gradient of this, uh, uh, of this secreted molecule in this uh, lumen. Now, uh, so, uh, and that, using a little bit of a transformation of, of, uh, of um, the uh, fact that the decay length of the gradient is the square root of the diffusion and the loss or the, or the rate of degradation or the sink, uh, one figured out that there was a, actually a very massive uh, removal of, the, of this molecule uh, from the lumen, luminal space to, to generate this gradient. Um, so we have the luminal uh, gradient so what happens to the cell surface? Uh, so to measure the cell surface uh, and its gradient, we uh, simply uh, nicked the, the wing prep and put an anti labeled antibody into this prep uh, and measured uh, what happens at the surface. Uh, and in order to measure the endosomal pool, simply warmed the system up and looked at where the fluorescence goes in the cell and measured that. And what we ended up with um, I'm not going through all the gory details of you know, all the um, you know, uh, analysis that went to this, but what we ended up with are surface gradients that were extremely broad. The decay lengths were almost half the, half the, um, um, half the uh, epithelial layer. Uh, and the on the other hand, the endosomal gradients were extremely small. In fact, compared to the, uh, the, the total wingless gradient, the surface gradients were very broad. Uh, the uh, endosomal gradient is actually much, much uh, 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 steeper than the surface gradient, but not as steep as the, as neither the luminal pool or the uh, uh, or the wingless total. Uh, <clears throat> so, so that obviously means for the surface gradient to be there, wingless must be captured at the surface. And what we know, wingless has two uh, receptors that will bind to it the um, uh, frizzel receptor and, and, uh, and sort of signaling receptors and non-signaling receptors that we call binding receptors. And we, we already know that these two uh, receptors take different endocytic routes to get inside the cell. Uh, and given, uh, uh, given that, uh, we've uh, uh, we sort of come up with the, with, um, you know, we've discovered these points about the, the wing, wingless interaction with the surface of the cell and its endocytic uh, trafficking. Uh, we um, <clears throat> uh, then, uh, you know, at the same time, my colleagues Madan and uh, Krishnan 
uh, we're, we're trying to understand what sorts of topologies of, of uh, the capture of these molecules by cells could give rise to a, uh, a robust uh, a system that would give us uh, a extremely good positional accuracy of, of measuring this, uh, this secreted morphogen. And uh, what they came up with after looking at ex many different models completely coincidentally, I must say we didn't tell them about our results, uh, they came up with a system where you had uh, branches and tiers. Uh, so it was sufficient to have two branches and two tiers, uh, for example, two receptors, by, uh, signaling and non-signaling, and uh, two tiers, to give you an enormous reduction in the local inference error uh, compared to a system which, didn't have, which just had capture at the surface. So, um, so simply capturing the molecule at the surface gives you a you know, a 20 to 30 percent error in the, uh, in the uh, local inference error, which is almost a, uh, f five or six cell, uh, um, cell widths, uh, whereas uh, using this multi-tiered model, we get an um, inference error which is uh, pretty much uh, negligible. But that required that the surface gradients or the surface distribution of the two receptors are uh, orthogonal to each other. In fact, you'd ex the signaling receptor, which is the specific receptor, was supposed to would have a gradient like this, uh, which is away from the uh, increasing away from the site of secretion, and uh, the uh, receptor concentration for the uh, non-signaling receptor would be uh, on this order. Um, <clears throat> and that's precisely what we found. We found that the the prisled, which is the signaling receptor, had a, a gradient profile that looked. Uh, uh, that was increasing away from the production domain, and the uh, non-signaling receptor had, had one uh, very similar to what was predicted by the model. Uh, so the model suggested that uh, if uh, we um, had an unperturbed two-tier system, uh, you would have uh, optimized uh, um, error correction. But if we now knocked out one of the legs of the pathway uh, of the system, uh, you would now get an increased error rate in this, in this uh, uh, assessment of positional accuracy. Um, and so, of course, since we knew what were the endocytic roots that were involved in this pathway, we um, knocked out the, uh, the endocytic root that brings in the non-signaling receptor, the binding receptor. And uh, sure enough, uh, we re recapitulated what the, the, the model was uh, predicting. So this gave us, of course, this has given us, of course, confidence that the cell is behaving, if you will, as a uh, autonomous um, error-reducing system by generating such a uh, two-tier, uh, multi-branched, uh, multi-channel uh, processing system. Um, and of course, it requires feedback, which we don't know much about. And that brings me to my conclusion, because I'm getting feedback from here. Uh, <laughs> and we have. Uh, a methodology, uh, as I said, to extract concentration profiles accurately from these curved epithelia. Uh, the wingless gradient in the wing disk is multi-tiered, which, you know, which was very exciting to us. And, and that multi-tier system is uh, providing the cell, I, I believe, in a cell autonomous way to reduce positional inference errors in the measuring of this gradient. The role of feedback is very important here. And we've just found that wingless trafficking is also regulated by wingless signaling which you know, is exactly what you might expect. I haven't talked to you about that. But you know, what is the functional implication of such cell autonomous error reduction mechanisms? How general is it? Uh, and, uh, and the cell now is behaving as a, as a, um, uh, a you know, accuracy producing device. And uh, um, I just captured this picture this, after, this afternoon from Xiaowei. And uh, I mean, can, it, can these systems produce amazing patterns like that with much more precise, uh, um, you know, spatial scales. Um, maybe this is, these are, this is one of the elements of that, of that thing. Let me thank people on the slide. Uh, Chetra was inspired by Woods Hole, and I must say, um, you know, thanks, Ron, for making that happen when it did. Um, thanks to Suzanne, Thomas Lequy also, who's here, uh, and, of course, uh, funding. But, and, the fruit, and the fruit fly, yeah. And the fruit fly, yeah. yeah. We have time for just one question. 
I'm still trying to understand like the intuition for how the branches and th that gives you the the robustness or the buffer against noise. And I, and I guess there was something about feedback, but are you saying that those errors depend on the concentration of wingless in some non-trivial way? Is that the idea? Uh, the, the errors going back in and out of the no, cell? No, the errors in and out depend on the intrinsic rates of the cell. Yeah. Uh, and the feedback tunes one or the other arm. Feedback from signaling tunes one or the other arm. I see. And the uh, and and the and that and I think there's also a separation of time scales, binding versus internalization, mm -hmm. and that uh, generates some of the robustness of the. Uh, it sort of minimizes the error in the uh, positional entry. Got it. Thanks. How is the error measured? The inference inference error. So w the error that we measured in the in the experiment. Yeah, was the I question was what is how the this yeah, is for the, the error measure the measurement coefficient of variance of the of the of the of the intensity of the uh, of the various gradients let's say the endosomal gradient uh, as a function of distance away from the production domain uh, the variance in in y right? I see. divided by the mean okay and by inhibiting the endosome stuff, uh, we get inhibiting the endosomal um, uh, of endosomal pathway on which on, on one side, uh, the error dramatically uh, expands, um, but the gradient shrinks. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, D2. Our last speaker is uh, Hernan Garcia from the University of California, Berkeley, and Hernan is going to tell us something about using physics as a microscope to dissect transcriptional control in development. Hernan. One second. Hello. Let's see something now right here. There's too many screens. All right. Let's see. Anyway, let's see if this works. Ah, there you go. Okay. So hello, everybody. It's been so much fun to like in some sense celebrate for DCP, but also think hard about the challenges ahead. So. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about some of the stuff we've been doing and how it relates, I think, to some of the challenges that are, that are uh, we're facing in the context of this 4DCP effort. So in my lab, we try to understand how you go from a single cell to a multicellular organism. We do this in fruit flies. You see here how the nuclei are going through multiple rounds of synchronized divisions. And even though all these nuclei look exactly the same to you at this point, each one of them already knows what they're going to be when they grow up because they're expressing a unique combination of transcription factors. And one of the great achievements of developmental biology has been the mapping of these transcription factors within networks, where you know you have a cascade where that first uh, layer of shallow gradients in, in the style of what Chito just told us about, those gradients are read out to give you all the genes expressed in broad domains. You get seven stripes, 14 stripes, you segment the embryo, you assign an identity to those segments, are you gonna be a leg segment or a wing segment? So we don't only know the identity of these transcription factors, but we also know the regulatory connections. So this is a fantastic state of the art to start asking the types of questions that we're excited about. And yet, despite this fantastic state of the art, I have a complaint. And, and that complaint is that just like this is not a pipe, this is not a fly. And what I mean by that is, if I change the names here and I give it to the world's experts on flies, they would have a hard time telling me that this is a fly. You can calculate a fly out of this. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna try to convince you of today is, is that the reason you cannot do that is because we're missing information about space, time, and concentration. So what we tried to do in my lab is to endow each one of these arrows with molecular and quantitative information that allows us to reach a predictive understanding of developmental decision making. Can I predict the developmental phenotype from knowledge of this topology, okay? And we do this step by step. So for example, what we do is we focus on one of these little arrows and we ask, given the arrangement of binding sites for let's say an activator on the DNA, can I predict the so-called input output function, the functional relationship between the output level of gene expression and the input concentration of the activator? Can I predict this so well that I, can, that I can actually calculate how this shape will change as I tune parameters such as the number, placement, and affinity of transcription factor binding sites on the DNA, okay? All right, so, and, and the way we're gonna do this is by invoking the same dialogue between theory and experiment that has been the hallmark of the physics approach for the last 500 years, meaning that we're gonna grab these cartoon models that we're so used to, and we're gonna turn them into precise mathematical statements that predict these input-output functions. And then we're gonna go into the lab and measure the input, measure the output, and the idea here is that this is a cycle. The theory is there to make experimentally testable predictions. Experiments are there to test those predictions and to inform the next round of theoretical modeling. 
All right. And, and even if you know, um, I forgot who was talking about different types of understanding uh, earlier in the, in the previous session. But you know, even if you don't care about predictive understanding, which you know, I, I like that, but that doesn't mean that that needs to be your definition of victory. I claim that it, trying this exercise is useful also in the context of using theory as a microscope to uncover things that you couldn't even see with the fanciest super resolution microscopes. And think, for example, of Luria Delbruck, where they looked at distributions of plaques in bacterial lawns, and they could uncover the nature of mutations. Or think of Hopkins and Nino, where they figure out that their error in translation rate was too low to be explained by thermodynamic mechanisms, and that energy and consumption had to be invoked in order to feel error corrected mechanisms. All right? So, you know, of course, if we want to try now to turn this sort of model into, into math, you know, you might maybe be a little bit concerned that this is a little bit simplistic. Because maybe it's not just about what is the concentration of my activator in the cytoplasm. Maybe I need to know something about what it's doing inside the nucleus, how it's binding and unbinding from the DNA. How, what does that do to the individual genes in terms of its gene expression dynamics? And then how do all these individual cells in the organism come together in order to generate a macroscopic pattern of gene expression? And I, my, my, at least by my definition, the way I think about 4DCP, this is the kind of questions that, that, that we're all interested in in the context of going from an organism back to the molecular level and then again, back to the organism, okay? All right, so the work I'm gonna to talk to you about today was mainly spearheaded by, by Jake Shaw and Nick Lammers in my lab with the help of Augusto, Jan Jun, and Simon, and it's also the result of a very, very nice collaboration we've had with Mike Eisen over the years. And the talk is gonna be divided in two very, very short parts. First, I'm gonna show you how individual cells control transcription by modulating their burst, transcriptional bursting. And then I'm going to introduce you to some new optogenetic methods that we've developed in order to uncover the molecular nature by, or the molecular mechanisms by which transcription factors regulate gene expression by modulating bursting behavior. Okay? All right. So the, the, today we're going to be thinking a lot about stripes. And this is arguably the most understood pattern of gene expression in all of development. It's called even skipped stripe 2. The name doesn't matter, but most of our understanding comes from these sorts of in situ. Uh, what you're measuring is the uh, concentration of this accumulated RNA in the cytoplasm. And this is great, but clearly it tells you nothing about what the individual cells are doing. You know, they could be expressing at a higher level in the stripe versus the, middle, the side of the stripe, or you could just have more cells expressing in the middle of the stripe versus the side of the stripe, right? And clearly, if you want to answer this question, you need to have single cell resolution. Like, basically, what I'm telling you is that we cannot even answer this specific question, how you go from single cells to a microscopic pattern, if I don't have that sort of uh, resolution. And so when I was a postdoc in, in Thomas Greger's lab, we developed technology based on a great invention by Rob Singer called uh, MS2, where what we do is we add a little sequence to the gene of interest that when transcribed forms a loop. That loop is recognized by a binding protein fused to GFP such that every nucleus in your embryo will have a little spot of fluorescence, and the fluorescence will be proportional to how many polymerase molecules are actively transcribing the gene. So this is what it looks like when you put it all together. In red, you see the DNA. In green, you see the signal. You see that this doesn't start as a stripe, right? It starts as a broad domain, and then as development progresses, it's going to get refined and refined. So this is the first time anybody can look at transcriptional dynamics in a living multicellular organism in single cells at the single gene level. And not only that, well, now you're going to see the stripe, but one of the cool features about this experiment is that you're staring at an in vivo single molecule experiment because each one of these dots reports on the decisions made by an individual DNA molecule in a multicellular organism. And that means that then all we have to do is zoom in and measure the number of polymerase molecules as a function of time in an individual spot. And what that reveals is this punctuated, uh, these punctuated dynamics, which are these so-called transcriptional bursts. Okay? And we're not the first ones to see these bursts. People have seen them in bacteria, in yeast, in mammalian cells. M much of that has been spearheaded here at Genelia in the context of the transcriptional imaging consortium. Um, but basically, the way that you can project this data, the simplest model onto which you can project this data, is a so-called two-state model, where your promoter can fluctuate between being in the on and in the off state, and where the parameters of this model dictate the burst frequency, the burst length, or duration, and the burst amplitude. Okay? So, now the question is, becomes, uh, changes a little bit. It's not just saying, what are cells doing in order to make a stripe? But it's more detailed in the sense that we're asking now, how are cells modulating their bursting dynamics in order to generate that stripe? And if you mathematize this model, what you see is that basically what you end up concluding is that if I want to make a stripe, I can do so by increasing the burst frequency, increasing the burst duration, increasing the burst amplitude, or any, or any combination thereof. And clearly, if you want to figure this out, you need to be able to measure the parameters, the frequency, duration, amplitude, as you move along the embryo. And to cut a long story very short, you know, 
we've developed technology that allows us to infer at each point in development what is the most likely state of the promoter. So you can see here the promoter switching on and off, switching on and off. And what I can do now is move along the embryo and ask at each position what's your birth frequency, duration, and amplitude. Okay? And what we want to figure out is how do transcription factors control these, or what, which parameters are they controlling? There's like five or six transcription factors up here. So which one of these parameters do they control? So once again, we move along the embryo and we measure, for example, the burst amplitude as a function of position along the string. And what we see is that there's no change. So none of the transcription factors talks to burst amplitude. We look at burst duration, also no significant change. They don't talk to the burst duration either. But they do talk to the burst frequency. Okay, there's a significant modulation. Which is interesting. I told you there's like five or six transcription factors here. They are all talking to the burst frequency. And this seems to be the case in most genes that people have looked at in single cells and also in development. And I thought, okay, there's immunity here. Like transcription factors are constrained biochemically to operate only through burst frequency. Okay? But then we started looking at other examples and we found a whole zoo of regulation of frequency and amplitude, duration and amplitude, frequency and duration. Right? So it's not clear what's happening. But in general, the message is that as a field, we've gotten pretty good at figuring out which bursting parameters under regulatory control. What we still have no idea about is how that control is being implemented at the molecular level. And clearly, if you want to answer that question, it's not enough to go from uh, output in single cell, single cell to a microscopic output. You've got to know something about what the transcription factors are doing inside the cell. You've got to be able to correlate inputs and outputs. Okay? So, I just told you that these genes are bursting and the transcription factors seem to regulate gene expression by modulating bursting parameters. And what I want to show you now is how we can start making progress towards uncovering the molecular mechanism by which transcription factors are actually implementing this control of transcriptional bursting. And, you know, we're going to keep talking about stripes, but instead of talking about the second stripe, I'm going to talk about stripes four and six. There's, this is one of those genes expressed in seven stripes. And the reason for doing that is that, one, is that there's a very simple regulatory logic. There's a repressor called CNRPS that comes in the middle of these two stripes, four and six, and determines the inner boundaries of these two stripes. So it's very simple regulatory logic. The other reason is that Dave Arnosti, back in the day, did this amazing experiment where he measured the change in chromatin state when you had the repressor versus when you didn't have the repressor. And what you see is that when you have CNRPS repressor, histone acetylation goes up, histone occupancy, uh, sorry, histone acetylation goes down, occupancy of histones goes up, accessibility goes down, and binding of activators goes down. Okay, so once again, so this is like very interesting data. It is kind of similar to the issue of the in situ I showed you at the beginning, right? This is, you know, in bulk, you know, you can't really tell what the cells are doing and how CNRPS, what CNRPS is doing at the single cell level. For example, is CNRPS acting by, in a gradual fashion, decreasing regulation uh, expression in a gradual fashion, or in a switch-like fashion? Is there any memory associated with it? Like if I get rid of CNRPS, this is, is the expression already locked? And if we decide that CNRPS operates within the two-state model of transcriptional bursting, which one of these bursting parameters is it regulating and how? Okay? All right, so let me answer these questions by one, one by one. Let me start here. And, and in order to answer this question, what Nick and Jake did is they implemented a bunch of all the technologies that we've been developing in the lab over the last few years to simultaneously measure input and output. So now you see in Magenta, this is the ho whole field of gene expression. And the, you're going to see the repressor come on, and it represses the, the transcription right in the middle, and you get your two stripes. Okay? So what we can do now is look at this same type of movie and plot the dynamics of an individual cell as a function of time. And what you can see here is in magenta, the transcription going through bursting, in, and then the concentration of curves goes up as a function of time. And when it crosses a threshold, transcription just shuts down. So re expression seems to be switch-like, and it's very sharp. Like if you're a Hill function aficionado, you know, if you plot the input-output function, the Hill coefficient is more than six, which is quite sharp for, for an input-output function, although consistent with other examples we know in development. All right, so we know that it's switch-like. Is there any memory? And to do this, you gotta be able to control what CNRPS is doing. It's not enough to watch, you need to be able to tune. And what we are using is this really cool light-activated nuclear export signal called Lexi. And basically, check it out, I turn on the light and CNRPS concentration goes down. Within 10 seconds, you lose CNRPS concentration. When you turn off the light, it comes back within a minute. Okay, so now we have the, also the capability to modulate very quickly 
in space and time the concentration of germs. And so, this is the same movie I showed you before. Check it out. We started with the broad domain of expression. The repression com repressor comes on. You got the stripes. But now we're going to turn on the light. And you can see very quickly, all transcription comes back. OK? So, you know, let's look at an individual cell. OK? And what you can see is how, again, the cell is bursting as a function of time. Krampus causes a threshold, no transcription. We turn on the light, and very quickly, you get transcription back. If you plot, this is an average, right? So you see KNURPS, it was growing, 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 growing. We turn light, it falls. You see the number of cells in magenta, the fraction, we have like 80% on. The moment we turn on the light, all cells come back on. They come back within four minutes. We think these four minutes are mostly related to our inability to detect low fluorescence levels. We think transcription ensues within one minute of turning on the light. But not only that, not only is it reversible, it's also memoryless. At least by the measure of, if I ask each cell, uh, how long were you repressed for, and did you take any longer to get de-repressed when I got rid of nerves? And what we see is absolutely no correlation. Okay? So again, reversible and memoryless. And the last question, so you know, reversible and memoryless, this feels a lot like we're dealing with this bursting model. So what is, is nerves acting through the bursting model? And what we can do is combine our inference of the promoter state, whether it's in the on or off state, with a simultaneous measurement of KNURPS. And what these measurements reveal, after some analysis, is that what KNURPS is controlling is once again the burst frequency, as consistent with what we saw before. And, but not only, not only can we say that it's controlling burst frequency, we can measure the input-output function. And to my knowledge, this is the first time anybody can do this in, in a living embryo. We can measure burst frequency as a function of concentration of KNURPS. And why this, is this cool? Well, the reason I'm really excited about this is because there's on the order of 10 binding sites for KNURPS in this enhancer, OK? And if you propose a very simple model where you say that the burst frequency is dictated by the probability of finding KNURPS bound to the promoter in just a thermodynamic mechanism, you get a pretty good, a pretty good agreement between theory and experiment. And the reason that this, this, this excites me in particular is because over the last decade and a half, like 15 years, We've been working on thermodynamic models that predict how the arrangement of binding sites dictates the mean rate of gene expression. And we can probably repurpose these models now to figure out how uh, this probability also controls burst frequency by tuning the number, placement, and affinity of transcription factor binding sites. And, and very much, not, not just use it to reach a predictive understanding of this tr the transcriptional control, but also using it as a microscope to start getting a molecular handle on what is going on like under the hood in these, in these, uh, in these gene regulatory networks. So with that, let me just remind you, this, is where this uh, work was spearheaded by Jake and Nick in the lab with the help of these fantastic people. And I also need to acknowledge my lab and these sources of funding that give us the freedom to do crazy stuff. And every, uh, all of you for your attention, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hernan. Hey, Hanan, uh, beautiful talk. Uh, I, I mean, what controls NERP concentration? Because, you know, ah. if, if that's going to be all over the map. What, uh, what sets the pattern of NERPs? Yeah, and also, I mean, you'd have to have a very precise control on the f concentration of NERP itself. No? I mean, it's part of this network. So, you know, there's uh, KNURPS is regulated by, by some of the main of these shallow gradients, and also there's cross regulation, there's cross repression of KNURPS and. Kruppel and Hunchback, there's, there's cross repression. So there's a whole feedback network here. The nice thing about the optogenetic approach is that you change it so quickly that you're not changing anything else in the, in the network. No, but in the natural system, there'll be, there be a lot of noise. I mean, the natural we, system, what? In, there'll be a lot of noise in the level of nerve. You know, it doesn't, it, ultimately, it's not as much. And I think part of it is because, is because we're dealing with a syncytium, and ultimately, protein concentrations and RNA noise gets averaged out. It would be a different story in, in the system you just talked to us about, because those are real cells. It was the same question. Ah, OK. <laughs> and you can. Ah, beautiful nice. throw um, and beautiful talk. Uh, so it, do you think that these equilibrium models work specifically at these stages in development where things are happening really quickly? Do you think? If you went later, maybe the organization of the genome and the mechanisms of regulation are different, and it's using maybe sort of a Hopfield-style model to make sure that you have sharp 
transitions. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, no, right. no, I understand. And you know, so uh, what, what Seth is talking about is the fact that sometimes, uh, you know, the, there's a, I talked about equilibrium models, I didn't define them very well, but basically the assumption there is that there's no energy being exp used in, in the process of regulation. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, has been to identify ways to figure out whether the system is in equilibrium or not. You could get predictions that are consistent with thermodynamic models and still be out of equilibrium. So you could be right for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've been thinking about that. And you know, theoretically, it's easy to do these calculations. It's just how do you make experimentally testable predictions? Mm -hmm. And I think if uh, we have evidence that even if this early on in development, it's out of equilibrium, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's, yes. it's about the bursty, uh, the burstiness of the um, um, transcription. Mm -hmm. So what underlies the bursty character of transcription? And second, when you say, talk about bursting frequency, do you mean that it is really with a single frequency or do you have a burst and then a pause and you have a distribution of pause between different bursts and you actually simplify the description by, you know, the mean frequency or whatever, the mode that is predominant. I imagine it's quite stochastic, in fact. It's, it's much more complicated than... It's absolutely. So it's stochastic and when I said we, like, we actually spent eight years and sat sitting on terabytes of data we couldn't analyze because it's such a hard problem, mm -hmm. computationally. So, yeah. The, what, when I say burst frequency, it's the average burst frequency. We're working on measure. If you could measure the distribution of bursts, that would be like super powerful for the, the similar reasons right. to what G two was telling us about. Now, what underlies the burst process? That's like nobody knows. In bacteria, there's some evidence that it has to do with the relaxation of uh, supercoiling through top isomeries and things like that. Here, we still don't know. That like nobody knows. So, like, is it a package of RNA polymerases that comes in and gets used up, but it's interesting that maybe at least the burst frequency is consistent with the fraction of time that Knurt spends on the, on the DNA. And you could imagine that that maybe stick, is not letting activators bind, bind, and maybe that's the activator binding is determining the, the burst frequency. Having said that, activators bind for like a few seconds, mm -hmm. and bursts last for five minutes. So there's still, there's still a few unknowns here. I don't think we understand what, what a burst is, and that's kind of the fun of it. Even, even if at the end of the day the noise doesn't matter, the noise of bursiness doesn't matter, it is a window through which you can uncover what's happening at the molecular level. One last question. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, so in the diagram that you show, there seems to be a lot of elements, um, but yeah. the, no, the previous one where like all the transcription factors interact ah, yeah. with each other. Yeah. Um, but I guess most people have looked at these single cell uh, transcriptional imaging for, for one factor at a time. And so I wonder if you think there's any benefit from doing uh, some kind of multiplexed imaging where you can look at um, the transcription of more than what factor uh, mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. yeah, like if you think that getting the, the, the K on, K offs like that uh, simultaneously would be uh, any advantage or not. It would be great though, you know, you run out of colors, sure. right? And you know, with, this, with the spot technology, we have different flavors of it. So you can do multiplexing. But it's going to be hard to do more than 10 or 20 or something like that. Um, the interesting thing is that these patterns do not always overlap. So most of the times, you got two or three inputs at one position along the embryo. So you could do this combinatorially. But it's, but it's a painful thing because of like, all the engineering that needs to happen. But you could definitely do it. Do we have time for more? Yeah. I mean, we're standing between you and dinner. So it's up to you guys. I'm just going to throw up yeah. a big question. So um, at this stage of different, you know, uh, development, each one of those nuclei actually have their own plasma membrane that... Uh, nuclear uh, membrane. Pardon? They have their own nuclear membrane? Or? They have, I'm sorry. They have their own... I mean, each one of the... The nuclei are up close to the plasma membrane. Yes, yes, yes. That plasma membrane itself has furrows. There are mm -hmm, furrows mm -hmm, at this mm -hmm. point. Um, we know that receptors on those plasma membranes actually are not, you know, diffusing yes. fully. We also know that those receptors on that plasma membrane are differentially being impacted, toll-like receptors, mm -hmm. by stuff that's been packaged yep. in that. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, there are there's receptor. This is sort of connecting to what G two is talking about. Yeah. Um, there's receptor gradients all yeah. across this thing. Yeah. We also know that each one of the cytoplasm around each one of those nuclei 
is not really exchanging. Right. So these are all like separate cells, if you will. I mean, there yeah, is some exchange, some but exchange. <laughs> it's not like a free system the way you've driven it, I, I, drawn it here. Yeah. And so I'm curious as to, I mean, those characteristics are, are impacting mm -hmm. this system. Absolutely. And I'm just curious as to how you think about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, for the story today, I wasn't thinking much about how things get transported. Right? Okay. And it's true that you have these energy. It's like there's cytoplasm, there's cytoplasm, yeah. there's like, you know, cytoskeleton, there's like organelles yeah. clearly like are surrounding yeah. the, the thing. Still, there is diffusion. Like, you know, big, the big gradient forms as a result of diffusion along the embryo. So there is some degree of diffusion that can happen, and the diffusion sure. rate is, is consistent with what people have seen. Having said that, you know, G2 show us, showed us a, an example of measuring wingless diffusion. We have a, the example of picoid, but nobody else has to measure anything else. So one of the things we're trying to do in the lab is actually see whether these simple models of reaction diffusion degradation mm -hmm. can, can explain yeah. the data and, or whether you need to invoke spatially dependent or temporally dependent diffusion, for example. Yeah. No, no, I, I think it, it's a great question. You know, to see or the order, I think, I think of it as it's uniform and yeah. completely freely diffusing, but I agree there are subtleties there. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. This concludes this uh, session. Thank you to the speakers and thank you all very the much. questions.